This is the Jabberjaw Podcast Network. Support for 100 Words, the podcast, comes from Talenti. When Talenti makes gelato and sorbetto, they tend to get a little overzealous. Did they need to use so many raspberries in their Roman raspberry sorbetto that the machine broke? Did they need to try 25 different chai teas to find the perfect spice blend for their vanilla chai gelato? Did they have to invent giant mint steepers to make their Mediterranean mint super minty? Does their obsessiveness make Talenti gelato and sorbetto the greatest? You be the judge. But yes, it does make them the greatest. And they're also the judge. Talenti, the delicious is in the details. And trust me, this stuff is incredible. I've been eating it all summer and I have to work out a lot, but it's it's great. Trust me. Dive in. You'll love it. Now, here's the show. Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of 100 Words or Less, the podcast. I am your ever-present host, Ray Harkins, and we are discussing independent music, people that make it up, whether it's the band people, whether it's the record label people, or whether it's uh, people who have been just highly involved with this whole beautiful thing and, uh, you know, maybe are doing something way cooler than just playing in bands, like, you know, running their own companies or whatever, but uh, have taken those principles and applied them to whatever it is that they're doing farther down the line. This guest is awesome. (laughs) I had such a good time hanging out with John Porcel, who uh, is commonly known as Porcel, and uh, he plays guitar in Shelter, Youth of Today, Judge, was the vocalist of Project X. The dude has done it. He's been in groundbreaking bands. He's uh, seen so much, been a part of so many different scenes, and um, has always been just so warm, inviting, welcoming, everything that, uh, you know, a good human being you want, you want to be. (laughs) And he uh, delivers that in spades. And uh, I went over to his apartment in Long Beach. We hung out for a good while and we captured some really, really cool conversations and stuff that frankly, I never knew about in regards to not only his own upbringing, but then just, you know, how he, went away from the scene for a while and lived on a farm. And (laughs) there's just a lot of interesting stories. And uh, I think uh, he hadn't, he hadn't really been asked a lot of these things. He's done a lot of interviews recently, but uh, I could tell it was kind of like, Oh yeah, I haven't really thought about that. And he mentions that in, uh, you know, more than one spot in the interview, but I got to get some, uh, some, some personal thoughts and some other business matters to attend to. But first I want to tell you about a awesome podcast on the Jabberjaw network called noise creators. Now, this is a show that I personally have dabbled around with myself where I dive into not every single episode, but uh, that should not hinder you from listening to the show. (laughs) It is a really in-depth discussion with people who are, you know, producers who if you have a passing interest in recording and documenting bands on record, this is the show for you. So find Noise Creators on any of your podcast catching devices, and then, uh, yeah, you'll you'll be able to listen to it. So there you go, Noise Creators, good show. But uh, more importantly is uh, I, I want to take this time because uh, this not only is fresh in my mind, but someone who is, was incredibly near and dear to me, uh, I went to a memorial service yesterday of uh, a friend of mine named Chris Avis, who actually I wanted to have on this podcast at some point, but he tragically died in a van accident about, uh, it's less than two weeks ago, and um, I've I've been really, really bummed about that. You know, he was in his early 30s, and he's been a guy that I've known for, you know, 10 plus years through the music scene, has documented tens, I was about to say tens of thousands of bands, maybe that's a little exaggeration, but he's documented over a thousand bands, that's for sure, on his YouTube channel, uh, Cavis Tapes, so C-A-V-I-S Tapes, and you, if you like music, you've undoubtedly, especially in, of the independent punk and hardcore variety, you've undoubtedly watched one of his videos on YouTube. He has recorded bands for so many years and has put it all up uh, relentlessly on YouTube and other video sharing services and um yeah i'm just gonna miss him and i had to put this little i don't know marker memorial whatever you want to call it on this show just because something that was really uh special yesterday at his memorial service was um you know you we had i don't know it was like 150 some odd people in the middle of bakersfield california which is like uh you know it's a it's a desert town it's not the 
most alluring of locations to spend your time. But so many people came out and frankly, it felt kind of like a show in many respects where everyone was, uh, you know, hanging out afterwards and um, just kind of reveling in the camaraderie of all of us being brought together by, you know, this tragic event, but how this one person affected all of our lives in a very deep way. And, um, yeah, I'm not bringing this up to, you know, bum you out by any stretch of the imagination, but I'm bringing this up because one person truly does make a difference. Like when you are out there contributing to something that you're passionate about, you are impacting people in ways you probably never have originally intended to impact people. But then also you can't calculate that as you're doing that thing. Like, you know, Chris is just recording bands and making friends and, you know, living his life. And uh, he was also doing a bunch of other things outside of the context of music. But um, yeah, I just want to encourage you to whatever it is you care about, just pursue that relentlessly and with passion because, you know, we're all here for a very finite amount of time. Each day that passes, you should hopefully be contributing something to someone or something that's greater than yourself. That's, that's ultimately the biggest takeaway I want you to have. And, uh, I will miss my good friend, Chris, but his legacy will continue to live on in all the bands that he recorded. So I highly encourage you, if you've never watched any of his videos, you can really dive in and, um, you know, see a lot of awesome sets from bands. So that was that. And, um, yeah, anything else I got to tell you about? No, I'll, I'm on vacation this week, so, uh, I'll be hanging out in Hawaii with the, uh, the wife and the kiddo and it'll be nice to take a, uh, you know, a break and, um, yeah, I don't know, just recharge a little bit. Cause, uh, yeah, the past couple months have been fun, uh, but very busy and in some respects draining as far as the, uh, you know, emotional toll of, uh, some of these, these events that I've experienced. But anyways, with that being said, this is my conversation with John Porcel, and uh, they are, they, as in Shelter, are playing This Is Hardcore in uh, maybe about a week and a half or so. Um, I'm bummed that I can't make it out there because uh, Shelter was a huge band. Mantra was such an important record for me. Frankly, more important to me than the Youth of Today records. Um, I liked them, and I like Youth of Today, but Shelter just looms so large for me. That Mantra record, um, I still can listen to, and it's just, it's, it's flawless as far as I'm concerned. Such a good record. And uh, it really opened up my eyes to a lot of uh, spiritual things, a lot of philosophical things that, uh, you know, my whatever 14, 15 year old brain really wasn't ready to contend with. But then listening to the lyrics, I was like, oh, yeah, I can consider that. And all that's interesting. So anyways, Porcel, great dude, hung out hard. And this is what happened. I'll talk to you after this. I, I doubt you're going to remember this. Maybe you will. But the um, I first met you. Uh, I was working at Century Media Records. Robert Comp, a you know mutual friend of ours. Mm-hmm. Uh, this was like maybe 2000, gosh, 2002, 2003 or something like that. Uh, he'd hired me to work at the label um, w- where I was doing. I was basically trying to bring in more hardcore elements to the label, um, and so. I just remember he like we were doing some barbecue or something like that at the label, and he was like he was like, hey, you know Ray, I'm going to bring uh, you know like uh, Porcel and uh, you know Ray from Youth of Today, and I was just I was like, oh shit, like that's that's rad. Like <laughs> I was excited because I was just like, oh yeah, like clearly you know as a hardcore kid, of course I love the bands that you played and everything like that. Um, and then I remember <laughs> this is again a total anecdotal moment, but it was like we went to like some pharmacy, like we, we had to go run an errand or something like that. And I was just sitting in the car just being like, this is so weird that I'm just like hanging out with you dudes. Like, I'm just like, you know, I, again, I feel like I was some like, you know, 16 year old kid, even though I was like, whatever, 21, 22 at the time. Um, I'm sure it's weird for you to have, not like I was putting you up some, on some pedestal, but it was, you know, it's those moments where you're just like, oh, these people who I've respected their art for a long time. Like, I'm just like hanging out with like, that's like normal. <laughs> How do you kind of diffuse that aspect when people do come up to you and are just like, like, oh, dude, Porcel, like, you know, they come in with obviously these expectations of you. Uh-huh. Um, how do you navigate that? I tell you, I get it all. I get it from like people who come up and they're really cool. Hey, Purcell, respected your music. Right. And then I'll get people that are just kind of like, you know, you get these straight edge kids that are like <laughs> starstruck. Sure. <laughs> I'm just like, what the hell? Right, right. I'm not like. Ace Fraley or, you know, I don't... Yeah. Or, you know, Obama or something. Right, right. 
But uh, I really just try to always be very, very, very friendly and talk to people. I'm always, you know, welcoming and open with people. Yeah. And quite frankly, I'm I'm just super grateful <laughs> that people, you know, are into the music and they sort of caught on to the message and it resonated right. with them. Because really, when I started the band, you know, when we started Youth of Today, that's really what we wanted to do. Mm -hmm. We wanted to connect with people. We had this, like, great ideas of where we wanted our lives to go and, you know, the way that we thought the world could be better. And we kind of put out this message. And, you know, when you're in a band, you just kind of throw things out and you don't know what's going to stick. You don't know if people are going to hate you for it. You don't know if people are going to love you for it. Right. And so it, it amazes me that here it is, it's like, you know, Revelation Records is having their 30 year anniversary. So it's literally like three decades later. Mm -hmm. And somehow or other, this stuff that I did when I was like 18 years old is resonating with kids that are like 18 years old now. Yeah. And it just, it blows my mind. And it makes me like feel great. It yeah. makes me, you know, super grateful and just feel like. All those years I spent in a like sweaty van with a bunch of sweaty dudes you know, for hours on it, it kind of meant something, and it and it um, uh, and it was worth something. Yeah. You know? And even though I didn't go to college, and my dad was upset, and you know all my other friends, you know from my upper middle class high school are now like lawyers and doctors and making hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. Right. Like I didn't take that route, although that route was available to me. But I did something that was that was actually kind of significant. And yeah, it makes me feel good. Yeah, no, that's cool because I, I do think it's like it is weird when, like you know, people that are involved in independent music and they get up on a stage and then someone like treats them differently. Like you know, you can either go one of two ways with that. You can go the way that you went with that, where it's just like you're like, oh, like I'm just a, I'm just a human. Like let's calm down. Like, mm -hmm. <laughs> or there's people that you know can buy into the you know the ego side of things and are just yeah. like, oh yeah, you're right. I am cool. Yeah. And you know when you're young, like it's not only is it tempting, but some people go down that road and then they never kind of bring it back to the middle or bring it back to what you're talking about. Yeah. Um, I'm sure there were times where you, uh, you know, maybe like you wrestled around with that idea of, I mean, obviously with your spirituality and everything that, you know, kind of kept pulling you back, like to never be even close to that. Mm -hmm. But were there, you know, were there times in your head where it was just like, oh man, I, I have to remind myself, like, I'm really not that cool. Like, let's calm down. Uh, not really. I'm not <laughs> yeah. like, I'm not like the level of, <laughs> you know, yeah, I don't yeah. know. Axl Rose or, you know, Morrissey or, you know, some of these right. people like I'm pretty, I'm pretty low key guy. Sure. But, you know, just along that route, it's, it, you know, it's, it blows my mind to see, you know, because when you come from the punk scene, mm -hmm. you know, the punk scene is all about, there's no egos, the band's on the stage, but yep. it's, it's the audience's stage too. And there's no barrier between the audience and, and, and the band. And we're all in this together. Yep. And that's really what kind of set apart punk, especially hardcore from other forms of music where it was like the band is up here on a 20 foot stage and the yeah. audience is down here and they're worshiping the band and they have their lighters out and all that stuff. <laughs> right, right, right. And so I just kind of came from that culture where, you know, you're hanging out with people and then it's like, oh, hey, you know, you shake a guy's hand and then he gets up on the stage and he's the, in the opening band and he plays. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. then you get up on the stage and it's like, it's no big deal. There's no rock star trips. It's, it's all very kind of low key. Totally. And, um, you know, it was, it's so weird for me to see people that even come from that scene. Like, I'll, t I'll tell you a story. We were, um, Youth of Today did a reunion at um, Riot Fest. Oh, yeah, sure. And this was, this was a few years ago. And, and uh, it, was it, was, it was incredible. Descendants headlined the first night. Mm -hmm. Danzig headlined the second night. And he did like a Danzig... Sam Hain, yeah, that's right. Misfits, I remember that. Yeah, kind of threefold thing. Yeah, Doyle came out and played it. It was actually awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> pretty cool. Um, and then the next night, Weezer played. Oh, sure. So it's so funny. Like, you know, I'm backstage the first night. Like, the Senators are headlining. There's one backstage room basically in, in that. I forget what club it was. Huge club, but mm -hmm. there was only really like one backstage room. So the Senators are there. All the other opening bands are there. Everybody's hanging out. You know, eating burritos and like, yeah. shooting the shit with the Descendants, and they're totally cool. We're talking about when they played the Anthrax to thirty people in like <laughs> nineteen eighty three or whatever, right? And so they're totally chill. The next night is Danzig. 
Danzig comes in with like his security. Get everybody the fuck out of here. Get them the fuck out of here now. Like he's lit- and like he's got these huge Samoan security guys that are literally like throwing you down the stairs. And right. Like, Shut this room and down. It's like, um, dude, we're playing tonight. Can I just grab like a couple of tortilla chips and a freaking <laughs> spring water? Right. <laughs> right. But he was such a dick. Yeah. And I couldn't believe it. It's like. Dude, you're Glenn Danzig, like the Misfits. You know, it's like yeah. you're coming from the same place I'm coming from. And then the next night, Weezer plays, and it's like Danzig is a drop in the water compared to how big Weezer are. I mean, those totally. guys are like genuine rock yeah, stars. Yeah, sold. Yeah, many records. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, millions and millions of records. Those guys come in like they're just dudes off the street. Super cool. Totally. Hey, come on in. Eat our food. You know, no rock star attitudes at all. I was just like, it was such a contrast. And it was just, it, it really made, it made an impression on me that like, you know, after seeing this, I don't want to be the ugly side of yeah. I'm in a band. You know what I totally, mean? Totally. Totally. Like I'm in a band. If you, if, if you like my music, you've basically been supporting me, <laughs> you know, even financially, you know, for whatever decades. Chances are I slept on your couch one time. Yeah. And so I always just, you know, it, it made an impression on me to just be cool with people. And totally. You know, you yeah, get yeah. That energy, whatever you put out, you get that energy back anyway. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and kind of, you know, backing up and focusing on you as a person. Um, you were, were you born in Connecticut or New York? I was born in Westchester, okay, which is you know a suburb of New York, sure. Um, but it's actually very close to Connecticut, right? You know, Ray grew up in Danbury, and his mm-hmm. house was only about fifteen minutes away from my house. Okay, got so it. So it was, it was pretty close. And what was your your family structure like? Like brothers and sisters, mom and dad in the house? Um, I had an older brother, younger sister. Parents were divorced, just like every other kid in my high school in the eighties. It was just like the boom of sure. the divorce back then. Um, it was very upper middle class, kind of rich, you know, BMWs in the parking lot of the school. Like that's like I didn't grow up from the streets. <laughs> you know what I mean? I kind of grew up in that suburban. Yeah, totally. Atmosphere. And what did your parents do for uh, work? My, you know, it's funny because someone asked me this question recently, and like, yeah, I'm not really quite sure exactly what my dad did. Sure, but he worked in the food industry doing something. He was some kind of like. High end salesman in, in the food industry. Got it. Made a lot of money. Right, right. Um, An executive. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. yeah. I don't, I, quite honestly, I don't know what the hell he did. Well, really. I mean, a lot of times. <laughs> I mean, a lot of the times when you're, I mean, not only when you're a kid, but like you just, you know, you're like, I think I know what my parents do, yeah. but like, you know, I mean, he never really talked about it that much. But he went to work and he came and we had a big house and lived in Westchester and sure. Um, it's 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 funny, you know, you know, talking about that because I just got interviewed. Um, for uh, uh, the the hundreds, you know that streetwear company, the hundreds. I do, yeah, yeah. They just did a collaboration with uh, with Revelation for right. for you know, Revfest, Rev yeah, yeah. And it's funny; it just went on sale this morning, and the stuff is like selling out in like minutes. Totally. Um, it'll probably be on eBay for like thousands of dollars. Absolutely, by time. <laughs> right, 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 right. <laughs> but uh, you know, they were interviewing you know um, they were interviewing me, and they were asking me about basically the the how youth of today kind of started this straight edge kind of look oh yeah yeah and they were like how did that even like come about um and really you know i was from westchester i played football i was totally into hardcore no one could have been more into hardcore than me sure i didn't look punk like i didn't have a mohawk and like a you know a studded belt and all that stuff right and so the youth of today look really just came about from we were just a bunch of jocks from suburbia who liked hardcore and we didn't want to kind of pose and sure. dress like something that we weren't. But you weren't, right, right. And so we were just kind of clean cut kids from the suburbs and yeah. that sort of just became the straight edge look and it was just very kind of natural for us because that's just who we were. Like Totally. We, and it was weird too because, you know, I used to have a varsity jacket because I was on the football team. Sure. And I'd roll into like CBGBs with just like – a varsity jacket and just like a crew cut and didn't really look punk in like 1983 <laughs> right. to see Agnostic Front. Totally. And people like would look at me like, what the hell? Oh, I can imagine. Like, yeah. Like, what? Did, how did you get in here? Yeah. What are you doing? Like, who are you? <laughs> totally. <laughs> and then meanwhile, I'd be knowing every single word to every single Agnostic Front. So I'm doing more stage dives than anybody. Sure. Um, but. But really, like, you know, that's just who we were. We weren't kind of like street kids. We weren't like thugs. We were just straight edge kids from, from the suburbs. And, totally. You know, well, we it's rolled. like the, the complete 
the complete unintended consequence of like when you are on the, you know, proverbial ground floor of something. I mean, clearly other bands came before you guys and, Mm -hmm. you know, you just stitched together those influences to make what you guys did. Mm -hmm. But I mean, especially from like an aesthetic perspective, where it's just like you wore these things because like that's either who you were and like you're like, yes, of course we wore, you know, high top Nikes, like, you know, all these things where it's like that's just because that's like what we wore. But then, you know, like because there's nothing else that really kind of came before that from that sort of aesthetic perspective, that's why people, you know, latch on to it and just like, oh, yeah, like. Like, like it was some grand plan of yours to be like varsity jacket, straight edge, like letter. Like, no it's, way. It's funny because people think that. Like, totally. Um, I remember when they asked the question, they said, was there some sort of meeting where you got all together and you decided to dress like that? <laughs> no. And I'm like, no. No. <laughs> Absolutely not. And, you know, it, in a way, it was more punk than a punk with a mohawk. Absolutely. Because you were like the alternative to the alternative scene. Totally. I mean, you know, when you went to CBGB's. There's a million people with mohawks and studded jackets, and yep. like everybody looks that. The same. That, is, that is the <laughs> uniform there. Yeah. Like, and you're you're taking something from the outside that it, you know kind of typifies what a lot of people should be quote unquote against in that scene. Yeah. And then you, people are like, yeah, but like they know what like you know they know they know the lyric like uh, like what you're saying because you came into this and you have you know a pre-existing knowledge of all these bands and you're like yeah I'm here for the show but they're like but you can't look like that yeah you want to be a rebel walk into a Chromag show at CBGB's <laughs> in 1984 wearing a pair of shorts totally <laughs> it's, like, it's like that's no not cool shorts it's like that's like the most uncool thing you do like shorts and like high tops right. like what's going on yeah that doesn't make any sense um, iHeartRadio and Grim and Mild present Bridgewater Season 2 a lot of people now actually Actually believe that there is some kind of mystical force in this region that attracts monsters and paranormal activity. The Bridgewater Triangle. Now that sounds about right. You're still denying that there's something beyond our understanding going on here? Starring Supernatural's Misha Collins, The Walking Dead's Melissa Ponzio, and Rogue One's Alan Tudyk. Written by Lauren Shippen and created by me, Aaron Mankey. Something about all of this doesn't feel right. Hello? Is someone there? Something went wrong here. Olivia, we should hurry. We have a much bigger problem. What is that? Olivia, (laughs) run! Listen to Bridgewater now on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. And learn more over at grimandmild.com slash Bridgewater. What's up? It's Angela Yee, and I want to tell you about my podcast, Lip Service. I created Lip Service as a safe space for women to talk about whatever they want to when it comes to the bedroom with no judgment. Lip Service means fun conversations and the freedom to talk about whatever you want. Lip Service is the one place where you can hear artists talk about the intimate details of their life and subjects that you might not hear anywhere else. It's where Nick Cannon felt safe enough to open up about some controversial topics with his love life. The stork is on the way. You know, there's a lot of kids last year. Oh, my God. Also, Lizzo sat down and discussed dating. This was before she was in a relationship. Oh, we never spoke after that, though. We even want to know why. Okay, listen. (laughs) (laughs) And even Cardi B came on recently, where she had a great time talking about life before her marriage to Offset. I thought you wanted a bad and bougie. You got a bad and got a... Make sure you check out my podcast, Lip Service, on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Do you crave a good mystery? Tune in to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio podcast featuring episodes of different detective dramas from the golden age of radio every day, Monday through Saturday. The lineup of radio detectives currently includes Sam Spade, Dr. Tim Detective, Dangerous Assignment, Philo Vance, Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, and Tales of the Texas Rangers. I'm your host, Adam Graham, and I offer commentary and humor after each episode and also respond to your questions and feedback. Enjoy a good mystery before bed, while driving, or whenever you crave old-school radio goodness. Listen to the great detectives of old-time radio on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcast, or wherever you get your podcast. (laughs) 
And I'm sorry, you said siblings? Like, you are you the only child? or? Uh, no, I have an older brother and a younger sister. Okay. So you, you're squarely in the middle. Um, and you. I tried, like, anything to get them into punk, and they just weren't going for it. Yeah. <laughs> you, you're, try, you're trying to rally them and be like, hey, guys, you into this? They're like, nah, not interested. Yeah. yeah. Um, so as you started, I mean, you, you've. For as long as I've known you, you've always struck me, you know, you're the same person that, you know, when I met whatever, you know, 10 some odd years ago, as I imagine kind of what you were like in high school where you were probably you could maybe mingle with a lot of different kids. Like you could obviously be on the football team and then mm-hmm. you could be, you know, going to a punk show. Were you always that sort of, you know, person that's, you know, upbeat and chipper? Yeah, pretty much. OK. Yeah. I mean, that, like I said, like used to today wasn't kind of any pose or any kind of forced agenda it just was kind of like who we were we right. were just more positive people we weren't into the nihilistic complaining you know dark kind of you know sniff glue in the bathroom type. yeah and we just weren't into it that's just weren't who we were so like the youth of today the positive outlook thing the kind of like you know the uh, the straight edge thing clean living it's just like it's just what we naturally gravitated towards. Yeah, absolutely, right. And, um, yeah, so that's, you know, I'm just sort of the same. I mean, obviously, I'm not the same person. I hope I've changed and grown. Of course, right. You know, a little bit. But that just that kind of core of, of who I am, who I was, you know, just still the same person. Right, you just build, you build on yeah. that. Um, and so then, you know, as you started to, you know, get into the subculture and start to, you know, do these things that were probably very antithetical to what your parents were used to. Like, did you, you know, how did that sort of friction play itself out at home where they were like, what the hell is John bringing home? What is happening yeah. here? I'll tell you a great story. <laughs> when I, you know, I'm so old <laughs> that when I was a teenager, the drinking age was 18. 18. That's yeah. right. Right. In New York, the drinking age was 18. So on my 18th birthday, and I mean, this is I was or I had already started youth, you know, youth today. Yep. You know, I, I had been straight edge for years. I'm coming home at night with like X's on my hands and like, of course, my dad just was just a, he was probably just like a little clueless. I'm sure. And so it was my 18th birthday. I come home from uh, at, at night. My dad comes home from work. He goes into the fridge. He takes two beers out of the fridge. He opens them both up and he says, "Congratulations, John. You're 18. Have a beer with your old man." And I was like. <laughs> Dad, what are you kidding? I don't drink. I'm straight edge. Yeah. I, like, I don't drink. I right, don't drink. right. I was like, I haven't drank a beer in like three years. And he was like, what? What is that? You're 18 years old. You're you're of the drinking age now. And you're not going to have a beer with your old man? man? Right. And I was like, no, I'm not. <laughs> That's amazing. And he was just like, he just couldn't. I just looked at his face and it's just like. It was so out of his paradigm. Yeah. Like that he just couldn't figure it out. Totally. And, um, you know, I think like a lot of people, even today, it's like so weird. Like I'll just go out with people, you know, random people from, you know, I don't know, work or, you know, whatever kind of like social contact. And they're just like, oh, and we go to a restaurant and they're like, you're not going to order a drink. Right. You're You're recovering alcoholic, right? Yeah. yeah. Oh, I get that all the time. When you're, you're, especially when you're adult, I find it like, you know, cause I mean, clearly when you're, you know, younger, you can say straight edge and people are like, Oh yeah. Like that makes sense. But like, you know, when you're an adult, when you're like, you know, 30 plus and you're like, Uh yeah, I'm straight edge. Like, what are you talking about? Yeah. I'm so glad that someone else has had that experience. Absolutely. Because I get that all the time. It's just like, and people look at me like, whoa, he must have been some hard, through some Absolutely. hard shit. Totally. They're like, oh, yeah, so you're, I, oh, maybe we shouldn't drink around him because, you know, and it's like, whoa, no, like that. I, but yeah, I mean, people that clearly don't have a context for music and that sort of scene immediately jump to that conclusion because that's the only reason that people would ever not drink, you know? Yeah. It's like, oh, gosh. Yeah. And, you know, the whole hardcore thing, like, wow, I, I, I got it. You know, I really put my dad through the ringer because. Yeah. You know, in high school, I actually got, I got great grades without trying. Like, I got just straight A's. If I got a B, it was like, whoa, I'm yeah. got a B. <laughs> Let's sit down. Let's sit down and talk about yeah. this. Right. You know, so, um, but I was so consumed and obsessed with music uh-huh. that I knew that, like, that's what I wanted to do. Like, I had no, I had zero interest in going to college. Right. Zero, you know, I just wanted to pursue music. It was like, it was my passion. Right. And so my dad... Like, not only could he not figure out that I was straight edge, but for me to, like, you're going to move to New York City and you're not going to go to college and you're going to, like, 
play guitar live in, a, in a small apartment <laughs> with like three other people and cram in a van and play a show for like little to no money and you're going to travel around the country like staying on people's couches and like you could be going to college and you could be on the fast track to making the money that I'm making. Right. <laughs> totally. The opportunity. I mean, that, that's why I find so interesting too, where it's like, you know, especially if you come from, you know, the suburban life where it's just like, Hey, like, you know, I can pay for your college. Like the path is there for you. Yeah. yeah. And then you're just like, nah, not, yeah. not that interested. And it's, and yeah, he it's, was like, he, and, and he just could not wrap his head around why I would do that. And, right. it, was, and it was, it was pretty funny because, he never saw me play. He never came to any shows. The, the only time he came to see me play was when Shelter went on tour with No Doubt. And we played a huge arena with No sure, Doubt. Sure, sure. And then he came to the show. Right. And he came backstage and he kind of gave me, like, he was so proud and he gave me a big hug and he was like, John, I'm so proud of you. You finally made, made it. it. You finally made it. And I was just like, it sort of hurt my feelings a little bit. Yeah. Because it was like, you know what, Dad? I made it before. Like Youth of Today, we had a, such a positive influence on like thousands of kids. Totally. Like, we, we weren't playing arenas. We were sleeping on kids' couches, but you know, we kind of had an impact. Absolutely. And so, you know, I just kind of like chalked it up to another thing. Like my dad's just a little clueless. Um, yeah, yeah. Well, and you're probably like, these people that are out there, they're not here to see us. Like, yeah. You're like, hey, dad, <laughs> this, this not, audience, no. not for if us. Only, if only he knew. I know, exactly. <laughs> but yeah, no, I can easily see what you're talking about where it's just like, yeah, maybe like piecemeal throughout, you know, youth of today's entire career, we played in front of this many people and we could have all stuffed them in this room and then you might have been impressed. But yeah. like, you know, that, that, that's, there's no, there's a cognitive dissonance that you know your dad is going to have in regards to that because he just yeah. he sees you're like oh you're playing an arena like great you've made it it's yeah. like oh yeah no not really and you know I always you know I have kids too my my son you know is sixteen yeah and I always try to impress upon him that you know what material success it doesn't mean much sure you know it's nice to have money you know of course you want to be able to support yourself and you know support your loved ones and, and absolutely things like that. but above and beyond like maintaining yourself and having a house and having clothes on your back and food on the table it's just like why are you going to spend so much energy into like trying to like live extravagantly when it doesn't even really make you happy yeah it's like more important is like who you are and what your values are and, you know, the impression that you make upon the people that, that around you and putting out like a positive message in the world. Totally. That's way more important. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's like a, that's like a spiritual kind of way to live. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, and I feel bad for my dad because he spent his whole life with that kind of like, uh, you know, bar of materialism. Of and course. Like he had learned like, you know. The more money you make, yeah. You know, the more that, the more stuff you can accumulate, yeah the, more, yeah. yeah. the bigger your house that you have, you know, that's making it, and right. that's being a success. And and I saw he really like knocked himself out his whole life to kind of like hit that standard of you know success. Absolutely. And, you know, and whatever, you know, I can kind of I can kind of understand it. Yeah, you can his, see how you know, people his, get to there. Yeah, his grand, you know, my grandfather came from Italy penniless on a boat, worked three jobs and, right. you know, own, you know, put himself through himself and my grandmother through pharmaceutical school by working, you know, barely sleeping, working three jobs and they saved all their money for decades and, you know, a decade and they opened up their own pharmacy and they kind of pulled themselves up from their own bootstraps and they made something of themselves. And that was like the environment that my dad was raised in. Sure. You know, so I can kind of get it. Yeah. But just for myself... Yeah, you, you know, saw you, right. My, you saw a different path. Yeah, right. Yeah, just on my own kind of you know spiritual path that I've been you know into. I kind of I kind of like realized that that's it's sort of an illusion. Mm -hmm. And money and fame and power and prestige and a, a good job and a good position in society that doesn't equal happiness in any way, shape, or form. And mm -hmm. you can see, and even my dad, so materially successful, so stressed out you know, unhappy, Yeah, you know, right. You're trading, you're, you're trading years for your life for like the accumulation of these things yeah. that, you know, you, you clearly you can't yeah, take that, with that you. That big lawn and that big car, it, there's a price tag to that. There is. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, totally, you know, I just, I, I just didn't buy into it. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, in, in, you know, this is kind of a larger question, but like 
in you know basically all the musical projects that you've played in um you've always seemed to be the uh you know what i would like to call the the contributor in the fact that you know you're uh you, you're the person that can you know write music for basically all different types of hardcore whether it's you know more you know melodic leaning you know more aggressive whatever it is like you're able to kind of insert yourself and be like hey like here, you know here's here's some riffs here's some things like let's build on this um do you think that's, you know, is, is that an accurate portrayal of you or, or is that something that in certain musical projects you kind of, you know, took more of a back seat and other people, you know, kind of did did that? Um, I will say this. Ray Capo, for his lack of musicianship whatsoever, <laughs> like can barely play guitar. Sure. That guy was a great songwriter. Like yeah. he came up with a, with a, like a lot of you know really good stuff. You know, I think you know my role in the band was always to take charge of the actual band. Okay, you know, like I was always the guy. You know, you know, we would write the songs. We would, you know, I was the guy that had to you know get everybody together for the practice. Sure, practice for eight hours. A the day, organizer, like, right? Yeah, and you know, really kind of like make sure that the bands were musically firing on all cylinders got it and uh you know and uh, and ray capo probably had a more imp- important job his job was to write the lyrics you know he was like the the, the poet of the band and i think even you know and mike judge also sure he was the guy that like you know steered the band ideologically you know mm-hmm. with this kind of you know tortured lyrics of course <laughs> you know, right, stuff like right, that right. and um th- and that was great i mean you know, that's like almost you know as as far as like punk and um, and hardcore, it's like that's almost like everything. You mm-hmm. know, it's almost like you could have a crappy band. Like Warzone weren't a good band. You know, totally. Well, they they got better later when they you know got better <laughs> musicians. Than, but when like I first went to see Warzone, like they were terrible. Yeah, like they, those guys could barely play their instruments. <laughs> right, right. But you know, Ray B's had a little something, and he had yep. a little something to say, and he said it loudly and boldly, and that was more important than being, even being able to play your instrument. It's true. So I think hardcore is is like that. Although I'm kind of like a guy who's into the into the music. Like mm-hmm. I would get a Dag Nasty record, I'm like whoa, and I would like sit down, I would like learn all the riffs, and I was just kind of like. I was way more into like the, just the musical aspect, just because you know I was a right. guitar player. Totally, you know. So I took more of that kind of um, you know that kind of role in the band. Right. The cra- the craftsmanship, like exactly. make, yeah, make, yeah, making sure that yeah, exactly. the musical foundation was something that you felt uh, yeah you could obviously present publicly and yeah. be like yeah I'm proud of this. And I was and I was actually more of kind of a guy who was like a producer too. Like I would mm-hmm. go in the studio. When everybody would else would you know do their track and then they would go home, I'd right. be the guy staying there overnight, you know, making sure doing the mixes, making sure, sure everything sure. You know, sounded good. Sure. Um, and it was just like you know whatever. I was just happy to do it. That's kind of like right what I was into. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's cool because I mean, yeah, every every band has their people that you know. D- everything contributes to the band yeah. but you know there are certain people where it's just like oh man I love the you know quote unquote business aspect where they're you know booking shows and doing all that stuff and then there's other people that are like man I can't stand that business stuff but this stuff I do because yeah. like yeah otherwise if it's like you've got five people that like care about one thing then it's like oh all you care about is a songwriting like alright well we're never going to get a show like yeah. you know there's- yeah, and it's, it's amazing that a band's really kind of like it, it kind of plays out like that like yeah. some, somebody will make sure that we get paid Totally, and you know, you know, make sure that we have enough gas money to get yeah, to the next show. Like, right, and that's like the stuff that I can't stand, like numbers and money and <laughs> filling a gas tank. Like, I don't even want to like deal with that. Like, I'm more of in the creative side. Sure, of it. sure. But so, hey, someone's got to do all those practical things too. Of and, course, you know, that's an important contribution <laughs> to the band, just as right, just as much as writing the song. So totally, and it's funny too because you know you learn over the years also that a band is more than just it, it it's sort of like greater than the sum of its parts like there's some there's something like look at like Morrissey and Marr mm-hmm. and Johnny Marr it's like those guys got together and magic happened like somehow like even on their own like you can see on their own like you know they went off and did their own but there's certain like magic of the smiths of those two guys coming together and the even like not even just those two like the whole band like you know the bass player and the drummer Somehow you got these four people in a room and destiny brought these four people together and the chemistry and the combination of those four people, like magic just kind of exploded out totally. of it. 
And, you know, it's really just like kind of how it was. It's like now, when I look back and like I think of like youth today, I was like, whoa. Yeah. Our first lineup, you know, one of our earliest lineups was <clears throat> me, Mike Judge, Richie from Into Another and Underdog, Walter, right. and Ray Cap was like, you got like, you know, five pretty kind of like powerful people in one room, like, like doing music that went on to like make all this incredible music for decades. After right, that. right. And like our next lineup is like me, Walter, Sammy, <laughs> you know, Ray. It's just like, it's just like you could just see that not one person can take credit for it. It was Absolutely. just like a bunch of people coming together and just that chemistry rubbed in the right way. Totally. Where something like, Extraordinary came out of it. Yeah, exactly. It, gets, it ricochets off everybody, and then, it, like you said, it's a sum of its parts. Yeah. Um, so, like, you know, because, you know, once Youth Today started to get out there and tour and, you know, start to, you know, be able to play in front of people and, like, get some momentum, I find, I find that time so interesting because, you know, clearly there was no roadmap to you know, like you were talking about earlier where it's like bands making a living. Like you'd be like, Oh yeah, I'm going to quit. I'm going to quit and do my band full time. Like yeah. that did not, that wasn't even like, it wasn't a notion. That wasn't even, a, that wasn't even, it didn't even <laughs> seem like it could even happen. It right. It wasn't even like a reality. It was like, right. You better get ready. Like you're just going to kind of scrounge for food. <laughs> totally. Or it's like, yeah, you'll, you'll like, you'll work. You'll, you know, you'll, you'll do a tour and you'll come home and then you'll know, you'll find some random job until the t- next tour comes up and then you're like, all right, cool. Then yeah. I'll, we'll do the tour. But it, the, you know, the, the thing that I find so interesting about that time is because there was a lot of momentum for you. Like, you know, you guys started playing in front of a decent amount of people mm-hmm. and, you know, you started to have to grapple with the idea of like, oh, what, like, I guess we're getting paid a thousand dollars for this show or whatever, you know, like yeah. the, these things of like, oh, wow, I didn't expect this. You know, how, like, did you find that, I guess, daunting? Like, once there was this sort of, you know, cult of personality that came around you today, not only just from like your reputation, but then the business aspect of it too, of just like, wow, I guess we got to take this seriously. Like, you, you know, know I, I will say this in youth of today, we never made money. Okay. And it's funny too, because like you said, youth of today got big. We just never did the math. It's like, Okay, Youth Today is headlining. Right. There's a thousand kids here. Right. It costs twelve dollars to get in. That's twelve thousand dollars, and we're making five hundred. <laughs> you know, I remember. Yeah. Youth of Today, the <laughs> most that we got paid was a thousand dollars. Okay. And we played the Anthrax sure. in Connecticut, yep. and there was like a thousand kids there, and we were like, "Oh my God, we're making a thousand dollars for one show!" And then me and I was like. But it's ten dollars to get in. We're right. playing a warehouse that has barely any overhead, <laughs> right? And there's ten thousand plus dollars being made, and yeah. we're making a tenth of that, right? And we're, we're and the we're, we're the, the reason that bringing everybody in. <laughs> totally, <laughs> we're the reason that there are human beings in this place. Yeah. yeah so yeah. I think like it was a combination of us just being clueless and promoters like ripping us off blind. Absolutely. And it just came from that mentality that we weren't doing it for money. Absolutely. We didn't really care about the money. We did it because we were passionate about it. Totally. And we were used to roughing it. Yeah. Like a hotel, like in youth today, a hotel, we couldn't pay for a hotel. We slept on kids' floors because we had no other place to stay. Right. It was like (laughs) either a a person's house at the show or the van. Like that's, that's basically it. But you want to know what was really cool about that? And it was cool. It just, it was like, Maybe something in the hardcore scene that nowadays maybe even can't be replicated. Mm-hmm. It's because like all the bands back then, no one made money. And everybody did it just for the love of the music and right. the love of the message. And there was something really kind of pure about that. Sure. And um, it was rough. Yeah. I well, mean, I, I, like I said, that, I mean, I'm glad that you're expressing it like that because I, I think it's so... It is so interesting because it's like, you know, I mean, then, you know, in the later bands you played in, you know, like once Shelter, uh, you know, became a thing and, you know, you guys signed Roadrunner and Mantra came out like, you know, clearly the the tide had turned from a, uh, you know, a mainstream music perspective, paying attention to independent music. Yeah. And so you had to, you know, reconcile that where it's just like, oh, wow, like, OK, this is a whole different beast than what it was, you know, six or seven years yeah. ago. But like, like you said, there, at that time, it was like, you're not you're paying attention to the fact like, dude, there's a thousand people here. It's like, I, oh, oh, wow, we're getting paid a thousand. Like, we're getting paid a thousand dollars. Like, that's yeah. insane. <laughs> so I the, the naivete is probably tied into the fact that like you were just excited, you know, like you were yeah. just happy you're here. Yeah. And happy that there was people there and they're singing right. along and like, you know. Sure. It was, I tell you, it was really weird when Shelter got signed to Roadrunner because we actually started making some serious money. Absolutely. And it's funny too because, you know, a, 
a lot of times you'd get these like crusty punk kids that would come to your show and they would like, you know, give you shit for it. Like, oh, look at you guys in this tour bus and like this and that. It's like, and then some kid who's like 18 years old, like living at home, probably had like parents have like a big house. I was like, first of all, dude, are you effing kidding me? Like, do you know how many cr- crappy vans and that broke down? I mean, you to today's van. Yeah. You want to know how much Youth Today's van that we did all those tours in cost? How much? $300. (laughs) Which is amazing you're even alive. $300. The guy wanted, what happened was we bought a van, like a pretty good van for about like a thousand bucks, but we didn't realize that it leaked oil. Oh yeah. Going to our very first show on the Can't Close My Eyes tour, we drove from New York. Our first show was in Virginia Beach. Mm Mm-hmm. And we didn't really, I mean, we're all 18 years old. We don't know how to <laughs> yeah, you know about a car. car. Right. <laughs> so all the oil leaked out of the car and the engine seized. And our $1,000 van that we just like saved all summer for right. is worthless. And so <laughs> I had $300 to my name. And we were in Virginia <coughs> Beach. Some guy with, some guy with, a, with a mohawk who <laughs> knew like, a, who actually like knew a lot about cars. He worked on our car and basically like said, hey, your car's toast. We yep. got to get you a new van. So he came with us. We found a like 1970s, you know, <laughs> Dodge van. It was one of those old, like old vans that has the motor like in the middle and it's like really oh, flat in the front. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. And the guy wanted five hundred dollars for it, and we had to beg him. We're like, "Look, dude, we're stranded we here. Have we only have three. We we literally begged him for like a half an hour. Finally, he just felt bad for us and sold <laughs> us the van. That was our van that we traveled in from Can't Close My Eyes to We're Not in the Salon. And Years. It's just like it would break down, flames would shoot out of the engine. It's like we would sleep in that thing. Not only that, what we'd fit all of our equipment. We yeah. wouldn't have a trailer. Sure, we'd have all of our equipment, all of all our your roadies, merch, right. all of our best friends, all of our merch. You know, you'd have to like. It was so uncomfortable. <laughs> totally, you're just you late. Know? Right, right. And you're we just... drove around that thing for years. And like, finally, I'm making like a few like like some money where I can actually breathe. And some like 18 year old punk kid is like giving me a hard time for it. It's like, dude, totally. screw you. You have no idea what I've been through. Right. <laughs> You're like, okay, I don't have the time to sit down and give you this history lesson on like, yeah, what the, the, the time and effort that we've put into this. Yeah. yeah Cause I mean, all people look at is like what's right in front of them as yeah. opposed to everything else that's happened. But I tell you, it was weird because you know, shelter started selling like hundreds of thousands of records and we started getting paid and like, right. We're getting tour support and we have like a management company and like um, uh, accountants that are like looking over all the money and making sure everything's like coming in. And I was like, I remember like we first got signed to Roadrunner and they're like, okay, we're going to give you a thousand dollars a week tour support to go on on tour. Mm -hmm. You're like, each person. Right. You're like, what? And I'm like, (laughs) yeah, let's never stop going on tour. And we did. And we didn't do that. We would go on tour all year round. It's like, right? You're going to pay me a thousand dollars above and beyond everything else that I'm going to make. Totally. Just to go on tour, I'm till the wheels fall off. Like, <laughs> I, like I'm in. We're driving this. <laughs> right, right, right. You know, fifty two thousand dollars a year. Just my base salary was more than I had made in my whole entire life. What to speak of? You're getting paid for the shows. Yep. You're getting paid for the merch. merch you're getting yeah. paid for the records. It's just like. Whoa. Whoa. Like, we're actually making more money than, like, I could ever, like, imagine. I mean, we're going down to South America, and we're playing to, like, 5,000 people, and, uh-huh. we're, like, we're on MTV, and we're, like, you know, after the show, you're counting the money. You're just like, whoa. Yeah, you're like, this This doesn't, like, none of that made sense. Yeah. iHeartRadio and Grim and Mild present Bridgewater Season 2. A lot of people now actually believe that there is some kind of mystical force in this region that attracts monsters and paranormal activity. The Bridgewater Triangle. Now that sounds about right. You're still denying that there's something beyond our understanding going on here? Starring Supernatural's Misha Collins, The Walking Dead's Melissa Ponzio, and Rogue One's Alan Tudyk. Written by Lauren Shippen and created by me, Aaron May. Something about all of this doesn't feel right. Hello? Is someone there? Something went wrong here. Olivia, we should hurry. We have a much bigger problem. What is that? Olivia, (laughs) run! Listen to Bridgewater now on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. And learn more over at grimandmild.com slash bridgewater. What's up? It's Angela Yee, and I want to tell you about my podcast, Lip Service. 
I created Lip Service as a safe space for women to talk about whatever they want to when it comes to the bedroom with no judgment. Lip Service means fun conversations and the freedom to talk about whatever you want. Lip Service is the one place where you can hear artists talk about the intimate details of their life and subjects that you might not hear anywhere else. It's where Nick Cannon felt safe enough to open up about some controversial topics with his love life. The stork is on the way. You know, there's a lot of kids last year. Oh my God. Also, Lizzo sat down and discussed dating. This was before she was in a relationship. Oh, we never spoke after that, though. We even want to know why. Okay, listen. (laughs) (laughs) And even Cardi B came on recently, where she had a great time talking about life before her marriage to Offset. I thought he wanted a bad and bougie. You got a bad and got a... Make sure you check out my podcast, Lip Service, on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Do you crave a good mystery? Tune in to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio podcast featuring episodes of different detective dramas from the golden age of radio every day, Monday through Saturday. The lineup of radio detectives currently includes Sam Spade, Dr. Tim Detective, Dangerous Assignment, Philo Vance, Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, and Tales of the Texas Rangers. I'm your host, Adam Graham, and I offer commentary and humor after each episode and also respond to your questions and feedback. Enjoy a good mystery before bed, while driving, or whenever you crave old school radio goodness. Listen to the great detectives of old time radio on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcast, or wherever you get your podcast. And I mean, how, and you know, in the midst of all of that. Um, like did you know as that started as the whole paradigm shifted and you had to like you know really open your eyes in regards to like oh wow like this you know this is clearly a new reality that i'm experiencing um you know do, do you feel that affected you in any sort of negative ways i mean you know positively yes yeah, you were making money but like do you feel that anything from that sort of you know business commerce meet art side like did that you know affect you at all you know what We argued a lot in the band about money. Yeah. And it just kind of sucks because, you know, once there is actual, like, a lot of money to be had. Yeah. People just start grabbing pieces of the pie. It's true. (laughs) You know what I mean? Yeah. It's just like human nature. And it's just, actually, you know, I think at Shelter we navigated it well. I mean, we're a bunch of hairy Christians. Right. So we have that mindset, you know. Right. I mean, you got, yeah. That materialism (laughs) is going to make us happy. Right. Um, Right. You, You had a core foundation that was like. Well, yeah, the wheels could fall off, but we still got this thing that really, like, that's what we're going to hold on to. Yeah. 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 Um, <laughs> but, you know, I can see how, like, you know, money, when there's big money on, like, on the table. And, yeah. I mean, you know, in the grand scheme of things, the money that we're making, it was, like, nothing. Oh, totally. <laughs> I mean, yeah, you're, you're talking about, like, a comfortable, you know, whatever, sixty to $80,000, like, total middle class, like, yeah. you know, salary-based thing. And it's yeah. like that. But when you're putting it in the context of a band, that doesn't make yeah. sense. And it's like, you know, the most that I probably made was probably upwards of $100,000 in a year. Sure. And I mean, whatever. That only lasted like three or four years. Of like course. I made a career out of right. it. Right. It's not like this is retirement money. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I don't even know what happened to that money. It's like totally gone now. But, right. you know, um, and you know, what people don't realize is that that's a 24 hour a day job. I mean, sure. it's not like you're working eight hours and then you're going home, you're doing whatever you want. You're traveling in the bus, you're playing the show, you're like constantly traveling. I mean, it's tough. Mm-hmm. You tried going on tour for a year. Yeah. Constant traveling, just like, you know, playing and waking up and barely getting any sleep. And like, you know, it's a, it's, it's not like normal people can't handle it. Nope. <laughs> you have to be some kind of like cut from a certain cloth to, to even be able to do it. Mm-hmm. Like it's, it's tough. Totally. And we went through a lot of members that just couldn't hack it. Right. You know, that like it would hit the road and just like, man, I'm, I'm going back, to, I'm going back home and getting a nine to five job because it's just too much for me to totally. do. Totally. How did, how did you, cause I mean, you said you've, you've done it on a variety of different levels in regards yeah. to, you know, the, the, the grind that you were talking about earlier to, you know, the tour buses of, of shelter and what have you, like y- you just always enjoyed touring. I just always loved playing music. Okay. Yeah. I always <laughs> loved it. As a matter of fact, I remember like, um, I got married and, um, you know, my wife got pregnant mm-hmm. 
And I was just like, man, you know what? I just can't live this pirate lifestyle anymore. Like I got a kid coming. Like sure. And I remember just being like, and it was it was a it was a big deal for me because like I quit shelter. Yep. And I was like, man, what the hell am I going to do with my life now? Right. It's like my I, I don't have a resume. Sure. My resume says <laughs> for the past twelve years I've been in a punk band. <laughs> totally. <laughs> you know, here's all no my records. Even, <laughs> no one's even going to take that seriously. No. Like, and so. Uh, and I actually, yeah, I, and I went back to, and I had a bunch of money saved, which was, you know, lucky. Yeah. And I just said, you know, I got to do something that I'm just going to be like slightly passionate about because I've done something that I've been super passionate about. Right. I got to find something that I'm just like into doing and enjoy doing. And I, I went to school for graphic design. Okay. And, you know, cause I was always into the, the look aspect of, sure. you know, even from youth today, just putting together this whole kind of like youth crew thing totally. became like a thing and a look and like a fashion. Right. You know, I, I was into, you know, I wanted to make sure that all of our stuff had a look that conveyed the mood and the message of what we were trying to do. And there's mm-hmm. an art to that. Absolutely. And, you know, so I was always very, um, uh, you know, one of the key players that would like, you know, put together like, you know, the look and the shirts and the t-shirts and all that stuff. Sure. So I was into that. So I figured, okay, that's something artistic that I can do that I can actually make a living off of. So let me like try to do that. Right. And I, and I did that for like a number of years. And then I just got like burned out on that. I was just like, man, do I really want to sit in front of a computer for 10 hours a day for the sure. rest of my life? Just like, and you know, when you do it professionally, I, I always loved working on my own stuff and, be, and it's like trying to like figure out like how am I going to create a look that's going to generate like, you know, a message. Mm-hmm. But when you're working for other people and they're like, make the logo purple and make it like this big and like you're trying to like do their ideas <laughs> and they have like no clue and they really right. aren't. Really, Horrible feedback, right? Yeah. And they're, they're really not into art. They're into business and they're just put the price tag this big, you know, and it's just like. And then it's just like, wow, I'm just like, th- there's nothing artistic about this. And yeah. I'm just like doing a bunch of stuff to help people sell a bunch of crap that I'm not, I don't even care about. I don't even think it's like a bunch of plastic crap that like whatever, I'm helping yeah, them yeah, sell yeah. that. Sure. And so I really kind of like lost my passion for that. And then, it ag- and then again, it's just like, wow, now I'm 30 something. Now what the hell am I going to do? I'm totally. doing this. And so I figured, what am I into? What am I passionate about? Again, I had to like you had start to take from stock, sure. and really kind of like you know get a little introspective. Mm-hmm. And that's when I opened up my first yoga. I was super into yoga, right? And my whole life, you know, from the time that I moved into a temple and became a, a Krishna devotee, a bhakta, yep, I'd been studying all this stuff and studying Ayurveda and studying um, yogic texts and Upanishads, and that was just like. It was I like always. It. it was always a part of you. Yeah, I just loved it, and I was into learning and evolving like, spiritually. And I was just like, "Wow, you know, I've been studying all this stuff that like yogis are trying to get in, like modern day yogis are trying to get into now. I've been studying this stuff in India for like decades. I could open up a <laughs> yoga studio, and I actually have something to offer right. a modern day yogi because I've been doing this stuff for twenty years. Totally, and so." That's what I'm doing now. Like I'm teaching yoga. We right. just opened up a, a new yoga studio in downtown Long Beach called Yoga 108. Nice. And it's so fulfilling for me. Yeah. It's like you know, I have a job. I keep people healthy. I you know send out some kind of like spiritual message, and I can make a living off of it. And you know what? I'm not making a million dollars, and I would rather do this and make a modest living. Yep. Than sell some plastic crap to people. You know that people don't need. You know, shove it down totally. to people's throats. Like I don't want to do that. <laughs> yeah, no, I, it makes total, I mean, the, the through line, it, I'm glad you laid it out as you did because it totally makes sense where it's like people have to go, you know, when you're pursuing an artistic lifestyle, there's sacrifices you make. Like a lot of people don't, you know, that it's not part of the bargain when you first start to pursue it, yeah. but then you realize like, oh yeah, I got to do this in order to like do this. But the through line that you, you, you drew is pretty, um, it's pretty easy to see why you ended up here. Mm-hmm. But, um, something else that's kind of tangentially related, but you know, because basically every band that you've existed in has always had some core beliefs, whether it's straight edge, whether it's, you know, Hare Krishna, um, was it, you know, was it weird because as you were growing up, you know, I mean, you're, you're whatever, you know, you're whatever, 15, 16 years old when you start playing in youth of today, 
you've had to evolve as a person over time and your beliefs have, you know, changed, like not to the extent of where you're like, oh, I'm not this now and I am this. But like, was that hard for you to like, you know, essentially be a target for people being like, oh, you know, I heard poor Stills not strange anymore because he did this, like, you know, whatever, all those, those things that happen. Uh-huh. Was that difficult for you to kind of, you know, be in, in public evolving? The only time it was ever really difficult is when I first um, moved into a temple and it was when I first joined shelter because I think like back I think back then people didn't really understand what Hare Krishna was all about or you know right. what bhakti yoga which is basically what it is you know it's a lineage of yoga that dates back thousands of years yep. they just thought hey this is really weird Purcell like kind of shaved his head and now he's wearing like orange clothes and mm-hmm. what the hell's going on and so for that very first short period when I first joined shelter I think people didn't really understand who shelter was and is this like some kind of like cult thing and are they going to like steal kids and bring them back to the temple and like <laughs> people just had like crazy and like literally people would pick at our shows people would like make fly anti like religion flyers and this and that and right just, and that was kind of <coughs> difficult like when I very first joined shelter and it was mm-hmm. kind of weird for me because hardcore for me was if you have something to say it doesn't matter if you can barely play guitar. You're passionate and you have something to say. Here, get on stage, play a few, learn a few chords, knock them out, and say your piece. It's Absolutely. Like, that's what it was about. And it didn't really matter kind of like what it was. It's just like, I mean, if you look at like the New York hardcore comp, like you couldn't have had a like oh, yeah. that rev comp. You couldn't have had a wider variety. <laughs> you had like nausea, <laughs> totally. and YDL, and Gorilla Biscuits. And it was just like, that wasn't, it, it was like, Okay, you you're passionate about something. Get on stage and say it, and write songs about it, and and it was like an open forum. It Absolutely. Was, you know, and for when people started like punk people started saying like, "Hey, you can't say that because you're bringing spirituality, and that doesn't belong in hardcore." It's like, who the fuck are you to tell me mm-hmm. what I can get on stage? I'm into this. If I want to get on stage and I'm moved to like talk about this stuff. That's my right. Totally. You know, this isn't like Russia, you know, in like the 1950s. It's like, you know, I have just as much right to get on stage and talk about Krishna consciousness as you have to get up on stage to talk about vegetarians or whatever you're into. Right, right, right. And so after like, I think a year or two, people figured that out and they kind of gave us a little room to breathe. And I think people actually took the time to like read the lyrics and be like, hey, I actually kind of agree with a lot of this stuff that, sure, that they're sure. saying. And, like, and it kind of took this whole sort of like scary, I don't know what this is all about. And I think people kind of really like accepted it. Uh, uh, to the, you know, to, by the time like Mantra came out, yep. people were just like super accepting and they were... Like, oh yeah, it wasn't, even, yeah it. it wasn't even a thing. I mean, I, re- I remember I saw, I saw you guys play with uh, Voodoo Glow Skulls at the barn yeah, I remember in, that. Yeah, in Riverside. And uh, that, that was, uh, I mean, that was, I think it was like 90, yeah, it was 97-ish or something. So, uh-huh. you know, you're still hot off, off Mantra. Um, was that the Halloween show? Was that the show on Halloween? It, you know, it might have been. I can't remember exactly what time of the year it was, but uh-huh. that, sounds, that sounds familiar. I mean, yeah. it, it was just a weird show because, you know, I mean, you're playing with like a ska punk band. And yeah, like, no, you know, it, was shelter. Weird. it was a weird tour. <laughs> totally weird. Yeah, that's right. It was a tour. But uh, I just remember where it was was like, you know, like going up to your merch table, um, you know, it didn't feel like this oppressive thing. Like, you know, this is whatever, 16, 17 year old me, but like, you know, I was already familiar with, you know, clearly what, what, what shelter was about, but it's like going up to that table and being like, oh yeah, like, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll buy some wooden beads cause I like the way that they look. Uh-huh. And then, but, but never feeling like it was this, you know, this, this dark agenda or whatever, but I can easily see why when that first started to hit the scene, why people would react like that. Yeah, people were really suspicious. Like, yeah. are we trying to recruit, were we sent by the elders of some kind of like new religion to recruit kids? Sure, <laughs> sure. Or something like that. Totally. And, uh, you know, but that didn't, it really didn't last very long. That's good, that's good, yeah, Which yeah. Which is kind of cool. Yeah, I mean, because I just... It's, you know, whatever, it's understandable. Something right. New, you know, whenever something new, what, what did Gandhi say? Like, when something new happens, people fear it, and then they... You know, there's stages that you go through. Exactly. Finally, there's when you, people understand stuff, they accept it. Exactly. Yeah. I, I just feel like, I mean, the reason I ask about the, the the toughness of it is just because I find it so interesting when you know when you're making these proclamations when you are you know in your teens, like some of the most volatile years in everybody's life, and then as their opinion evolves, either you know, either good or bad, um, you know, in a certain person's perspective, um, 
it's I, I find it so sad when people throw so many stones immediately at these people when they're just like, well, yeah, I believe that two years ago, but like I don't believe that anymore. Not and like like I said, not so much in dramatic fashion where it's just like, oh yeah, I'm straight edge and then I'm not anymore. It's like yeah, you know that happens to a lot of people. Mm-hmm. But uh, just the the growing up in the public eye in such a minuscule level as independent music, you know. Yeah. But it's like you just see you know you see child actors go through it and it's just like. They're, they're growing up like a lot of it has to do with the fact that you're young and you have no idea what you're doing yeah you know luckily for me yeah it's weird because you know now the hardcore scene is like a lot of hardcore kids come from metal yep which is a whole just kind of just different culture totally than, than punk like yep. I came from a punk scene where it's like I'm gonna do what I wanna do and I'm gonna be into what I'm gonna be and I'm gonna look like what I wanna look like and I don't give a fuck what you think about it. Totally. <laughs> like, I'm just going to do and live my life the way that I want to do it and the way that I'm going to follow my path wherever that may take me. And if you don't agree with it, that's freaking too bad for you. Right. And I've always, you know, from being like a whatever, a 16 year old kid, you know, dressing punk in a preppy, you know, upper middle class Westchester high school, <laughs> I didn't care. Sure. You know, and it kind of like set me up to like, really not care so much about criticism and you know even like when youth today first started i mean there was no there was no straight edge scene no (laughs) there was never a straight edge scene there was a pocket full of straight edge bands you had like minor threat like none of the band all the members weren't even straight edge totally and so there was nothing like that it wasn't a community you were plugging into yeah we had to kind of like we had to literally like kind of pioneer that we were like Lewis and Clark, you know, it was just like <laughs> right. people throwing beers at us. Sure. You know, people want to fight us. Skinheads want to fight us. Like, you know, take that X off your hand now or I'm going to like freaking cut your hand off kind of thing. And it was just like, it never really, it, I mean, it, it, it never really bothered me or it, I mean, obviously it bothered me when I'm getting pool. Yes. Yeah, so, right. <laughs> yeah. Beer is poured over my head. <laughs> But um, it never really deterred me from, yeah. or any of us, yeah. you know, from what we had to say. No, I mean, that, and that, that's an important thing where it's like the, you know, the, the lumps you may take because you're expressing something, you know, like you said, as long as it doesn't deter you, it's just yeah. like, well, these are things that we're going to have to go through because apparently having an opinion about this yeah. is, is really threatening these other and people. And it's funny because, you know, especially in the internet age. Yeah. You will have people, no matter what you do, you could be, if Mother Teresa had a freaking message board, there'd be people on there complaining about her. You know what I mean? It's just like, there's just people out there that are behind their keyboards and they're like anonymously want to criticize every single thing that you do and nothing's good enough for them. And it's just like, you know what? You got to have like kind of like a tough skin and just let that stuff bounce off. Slide off. You just have to, you really just have to be set in like, you know, I have this kind of thing that I that you know that I want to do and it's my work and not everybody may understand it it's my mm-hmm. path and you just got to kind of be cool with that totally <laughs> yeah you're like that that's that's what I'm doing yeah um you know kind of through that ebb and flow of you know all the what we were talking about earlier like all the different styles of hardcore you played and you know the fact that you've always remained engaged in it from the fact that you're producing music you know for years and years and years um were there, was there ever a time where you felt I guess, kind of, you know, disillusioned towards hardcore in particular. And when I say hardcore, I don't mean the music, but just like, you know, the scene as in everything else, you know, ebbs and flows and positives and negatives. Like, Mm -hmm. so did you ever feel um, at certain times where you're just like, this is too much. I got to step away, like step away in the sense of like, okay, I can't be as involved as I once was or whatever, you know, did, was there times that you had to, I guess, step back? Early on, I mean, definitely at the end of Youth of Today and at the end of Judge, uh huh. You know, there was that bubble in the scene, like you know the Rev Comp, you know, days when it was like sick of it all and Warzone and Youth of Today and Gorilla Biscuits, and we were all just kind of like one big happy Lower East Side family, <laughs> yeah. rallied around hardcore. We always supported you know everybody else's bands, and there was kind of like a good vibe in the scene of like unity, and you looked out for people, mm-hmm. and it was kind of like us against the world and like you wouldn't beat up another punk because whatever you have his back you know totally. what I mean and the New York hardcore scene drastically changed around like the 90s where a real kind of like dark violent element came in there was people that were coming in from all you know different scenes a lot of metal kids coming in mm-hmm. um, and I'm not saying that necessarily those kids were bad either it's just like you know kids were kids and some kids were cool some kids were weren't sure but it got super violent it got super violent. There's, you know, they closed down CBGBs for a couple of weeks. It's someone pulled out a gun and shot at somebody else. Like, 
that would have never happened, you know, like back in the, back yeah. in the day, yeah, yeah, like whatever, like, like a couple years prior. And I got super disillusioned with the scene. I was just like, you know what, like this has turned into something that just like I'm not into. And if this is like hardcore, you know, modern day hardcore, like 1990, like I just don't want to be involved in this, right? And so I got totally out of heart. That's actually when I really got into. Um, Bhakti yoga and, and, sure. and Krishna consciousness. Like I just kind of moved away. I, I actually mo- I left the Lower East Side and I moved into a cow protection farm mm-hmm. in the middle of nowhere in Pennsylvania. Okay, and I was like milking cows. Sure, like it couldn't have been. You could have been any, more removed, right? It could have been any farther from like being in, involved in the punk scene in like the Lower East Side of New York City. Sure, and it was great. Sure. It was like the, it was the detox that I needed from the kind of like the ugly side of that scene. Right. And it was also good because, you know, in music, there's like competition and you're worried about the next band kind of like stealing your crown or whatever. You know, there's always that kind of like aspect when you're young and you're like, you're Absolutely. in a band. And so I really needed a break. And so it was perfect. I was out in like nature and like taking care of animals and I'm like farming and, you know. Uh, and that was always kind of like a, a part of me too. Like I was always into like natural living and healthy living. That was like, like a, a, one of the undercurrents of youth today also. Sure. So to actually go out and live in a farm and be like so connected to the earth, it was, it was great. Totally. And I remember, so I'm on that farm <laughs> and little did I know, like I didn't even, I barely like, you know, there was no newspapers like any, like I, no TV. I didn't know what was going on in the totally, world. Totally, totally. But, <laughs> you know, like not to my you know uh little did i know shelter's guitar player you know vic had quit to start 108 yep and shelter were like oh my god we don't know who we're gonna get to play guitar they went to it they they just threw up they couldn't find a guitar player uh-huh. so they decided we're just gonna go to india and just take a trip to india because we can't <laughs> find a guitar player and then they came back and they're like man what are we gonna do there's no guitar players around sure and there was some straight edge kid that was at the temple it was like ray why don't you get purcell because he's like a Christian now. He's on that farm. He's probably just doing nothing on the farm. And Ray was like, what? What? <laughs> and so he came to the farm. Yeah. And he came with all the other guys at Shelter. It was like a whole kind of entourage of like straight edge kids and like the band <laughs> Shelter. Yeah. I had no idea that they were coming. And sure. I'm in the barn one day. Uh-huh. And they came in there and Ray was like, this is so great. You're a devotee now. You can join Shelter. <laughs> we'll join Force again. It'll be great. Just like you today. And I was, and I was like... Ray, I don't know how to tell you this, but there's no way you're dragging me back to the hardcore scene. It's like, I just got myself out of the hardcore scene. Totally, totally. And um, he, I, if you know Ray Capo, mm-hmm. he can be one of the most inspirational people Oh, absolutely. Ever. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> sell, sell ice to an Eskimo. Yeah, right. exactly. Yeah. Like, he's just got this in him where he can just, like, rally people around, like, an idea. Like, no one can. Like, totally. More, like, more than like Obama can, you know yeah. what I mean? So he kind of like said, hey, look, you know, this is like the story of the Bhagavad Gita. You know, Arjuna was a warrior. Krishna didn't tell him to stop being a warrior and like go off to some cave somewhere and meditate. He said, you do what you do, but you do it for a good cause. And he said, you're not a farmer. You're not like a, a like a, you know, cowherd boy or like you know a yeah, cowboy yeah. <laughs> he said you're a musician and look at what you've done you 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 have this kind of like charisma and this energy where you can go out and you can you know make people you know ha- you know inspire people towards better living that's what you've been doing right so why don't you just take that and you just you have this natural propensity this natural these natural talents you should just take that and you should use it in a way that's going to do good for other people just like arjuna did in the bhagavad gita there was this big war horrible guys are on one side <laughs> if they come to power so many people are going to suffer yeah. he's a great warrior he should fight against this and do good for a lot of people and i was like you know what? That makes a lot of sense. <laughs> you're like, yeah, yeah, you're right, right? That's absolutely correct. I was like, I'm on board. <laughs> I love that. I and love so that. So I joined Shelter, and I tell you, I really like, you know, coming from the hardcore scene where, you know, it was always tinged with ego. Sure. And it tinged with trying to be in a good band, and like, there's the whole kind of like head trip that comes from people kind of like look up to you, and you're on absolutely. stage, and especially youth of today. I mean, People freaking loved us, you mm-hmm. know, like straight edge kids really like 
you know, we would have people, you changed my life, you know, absolutely. Kind of yeah, thing. yeah, totally. And, uh, you, it's, it's, it's a razor's edge that you have to walk to not think, Hey, I am a big deal. Exactly. And you know, you throw a lot of ego into the band and totally. And when you do that, you suffer because one day you're up, one day you're down. Exactly. And if you're in it for name and fame, guess what? You're going to come up and then you're going to come it's down. Go- yeah. It's gone just suffer. as quickly as it comes. Exactly. exactly. So when we when I did shelter, I really tried to do it in a way that you know what I'm not going to throw ego into this. Yeah, I'm doing this for a message, and I'm doing this for you know try to inspire kids towards a more spiritual path. And whether we succeed or whether we fail, I'm not going to be so concerned about that. I'm more concerned of, of trying to do it as a service. Totally, you know the positive know. impact that you can yeah. make. Yeah. And when I did that in a very concerted way in that mood, I found that doing a band was a whole different thing. Yeah. And it didn't matter if we rolled up into Iowa and there was 10 kids there. Right. Or if we played Southern California and there was 1,500 kids there. You know, for us, it was the same thing. We were just trying to, like, go and promote a good message. Totally. It didn't really matter. And when you kind of extract your ego from that. It becomes a very kind of like joyous thing. Yeah. And there is no downside. And if it comes to the time when the band ends, great. I did a lot of good stuff in the time that I did it. Now it's time to move on to you move on to something else. Totally. And when I did it in that way, I enjoy doing shelter than even even more than doing youth there or, or any other band because I really just try to do it in that mindset. Well, I think what you achieved I mean is perspective. Yeah. You were you were able to have a, a different experience that leveled you out to where you were like, oh yeah, like this this is at what at the core me being on a farm and contributing to the planet, contributing to the health of these cows, whatever was was connecting you to that. It's the same principle as connecting you, like you said, you're offering like you're literally offering a service. You are offering a positive message yeah. to people as long as they're willing to listen. It's like what what is going to you know in the grand scheme of things, what's going to do more to help the environment? Me sitting on this farm and like personally farming. Or me going out and trying to raise public awareness about like yeah. eating healthy and vegetarianism and don't kill the animals. Totally. And, you know, let's be the pat. We're kind of as a society, we've gone off, you know, off the mark, and we're polluting the you know the environment faster than we can even you know than anything. So, you know, and I think a lot of kids kind of. They they kind of got it like sure hey let's live more naturally let's and it's 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 funny too because you know when shelter first started I mean there was no like Whole Foods <laughs> no <laughs> there no. was no like even just to get vegetarian food it was hard yeah yeah what's to speak of vegan food there was no there was I remember the only vegan thing in a whole <laughs> first of all you had to find a health food store absolutely even in New York City there was only a handful of health food stores totally and I remember the I remember the first vegan thing that came out was pizza soy. Do you remember that? I do. And it was like the worst tasting pizza Terrible. like in the whole world. But it was just you like, can, but you convinced yourself. You were just like, this is great. But it was cool. I was like, oh my God, a vegan pizza. Totally. Like it was so it's great. So amazing. <laughs> totally. This just revolutionized my food. Yeah. yeah exactly. Yeah. And it was kind of like cool to see like little by little. And it's it's amazing. Like, and I and I like to think that that in some little way we mm-hmm. kind of inspired a little ground roots. Oh, the swelling of this whole thing where now it's like you have whole foods. Oh, and yeah. You have so much more of an opportunity to be a vegetarian or a vegan or a raw foodist or like whatever. Totally. And it's just and it's really just, you know, has become like part of the fabric of our. Yeah. Society. You say you say those words and people don't go, what? Like what? what I don't know, vegetarian. What does that mean? It's yeah. like, yeah, but everybody knows what vegetarianism is. Most people know what veganism is and most people even know like the different variations of those things of just like, oh, so like you're a raw vegan. They're just like, yeah, they, you know, even five years ago, that was incomprehensible, incomprehensible. And even like when like when you can like walk into a freaking fast food restaurant totally. and have a veggie burger. It's yeah, like, yeah, yeah. You're like, wow. It's like, is- wow, we've come so far. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> um, the last when thing- I was in high school, yeah. not one person was vegetarian. Oh, yeah, I can and imagine. It's, a, and it's like, you didn't even put two and two together that like, oh, this hamburger that I'm eating from the lunch line that's like grade D <laughs> meat, this isn't good for me. Like, you just thought, oh, it's oh, part it's of the burger. four food groups. Yeah, it's yeah. actually healthy. Right. It's got and, protein. <laughs> and, and, you know, just for you know, for all this stuff to finally kind of come into public awareness and, like, 
I feel good that we were kind of like, like I said, we were almost like pioneers of this stuff back when it was Absolute. unheard of. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. You were on the ground floor from that perspective. Yeah. Um, the last thing I want to hit on was the, uh, you know, the notion. So you've participated in reunions for, you know, almost every single band that you've ever played in, with mm-hmm. the exception of Project X, which, which some would argue that you've done. We actually did a reunion <laughs> exactly. in South America. It was great. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but um, so, you know, and the, the people that are, 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 you know, in the same way that you're talking about the, the criticism that, you know, one would uh, heap upon people on the Internet and everything that, you know, pushing that aside. Mm-hmm. Um the the experiences of of doing reunion shows and playing in front of people that you know may have never got to see your bands and that sort of stuff is you know obviously positive mm-hmm. you know how have you dealt with that you know the the notion that i'm sure people would heap upon you where it's just like oh cool like they're doing this for a payday or they're doing this yeah. for other you know uh in non-genuine reasons or whatever how like you know clearly it's not stopped you like you were talking about yeah. earlier where it's just like oh yeah people will say their stuff and that's fine we're still gonna do what we're gonna do yeah. but um you know how you have you navigated that with you know a variety of bands yeah it's funny too because i because you do hear stuff like that totally oh you sell out you're getting back together <laughs> you guys right. are making like two thousand dollars at the show <laughs> totally like, um, dude, I'm not going to retire off this. <laughs> There's 2,000 kids here. Right, exactly. <laughs> you know? Um, hey, I've always, like, anytime, anytime any, any one of those guys calls me up, hey, you want to play a show? I'm just like, oh, I get to play music that I love <laughs> with people that I love yeah. and spread a good message to a bunch of, like, new kids who probably never seen the band. Win, win, win. Where do I sign up? Right. It's just like... People are so freaking critical. They'll find any little thing to criticize you about. It's just like, you know what? What are you doing with your life behind your keyboard? What are you doing to like, what have you done? Like, what have you done to influence other people in in a good way? You know, so I don't really like, I don't really like let it bother me whatsoever. Any excuse that I can like get together with like Ray Capo and Walter and like hang out. I love those guys. Of course. You know what I mean? What to speak of like playing music that we did when we were kids that like means a lot to other people and people want to hear the songs. It's like that, that to me is so much more important mm-hmm. than some kid who's going to sit behind his keyboard and like who probably has wanted to do a band but never did a band and he's like right. bitter about it right and he's going to criticize us about it totally yeah. or you're going to you're going to tarnish your reputation by doing this and it's like well if that is the case if we are tarnishing this reputation we've we've maybe thought about that like we've already yeah. had that discussion if yeah. that is something that you are considering it's like yeah. that's you know that and you want to know something at least we worked hard to build a reputation it's like what the hell have you done in your life that's true that's a good point <laughs> right you know what kind of dent have you made in the world besides like you know criticizing other people? We went out and did something at least, kind of recognize that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like that, we, we, there there has been a substantial effort that has been placed in this previously. Yeah. So it would, the fact that we can do whatever we want with it now, that's like that's ultimately up to us. Yeah. <laughs> and it's funny too, you know, because um, you know Mike has always wanted to do some new music. Mike's like, I got a whole notebook of lyrics. I would love to do some new music. So there's been like rumblings about like. Um, doing some new ju- doing new judge recording maybe yeah. doing like four songs sure and it's funny like sometimes I'll tell people like yeah you know judge my recording don't do don't that do- don't do that oh my god you're gonna make like a new metal record and you're gonna just like ruin everything it's just like <laughs> dude are you kidding me it's just like if you don't like if you don't like 2017 judge that's fine it doesn't need to like it, it's not gonna negate the material that was put out before that yeah like I, that I've never I've always I've never understood that cognitive dissonance that people have where it's just like okay if you don't like this version of said project or band or whatever that exists now and is putting out new music or whatever that's fine you yeah. can still like the records you did it's not gonna all of a sudden be like oh man the self-titled Bernie piece sucks now it's like what are you talking about yeah just because you don't like their most recent EP doesn't mean anything yeah and I just the, the, it's, I mean, it's a I, one-to-one correlation I, 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 get, I don't again, get again like I'm a punk rocker you tell me that I, I almost want to do it more <laughs> that's true it's a good point you're just like oh yeah well of course, maybe maybe instead of four songs, it's going to be twelve songs. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> totally. But it's just like it, it's so funny where you know people like God, man, they just want to strangle you and like yeah. not even give you any room to breathe. It's yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Man, yeah. It's just kind of like, uh, <clears throat> and I wonder if it's like in all scenes or if it's just kind of like particular to the punk scene where people are just like so yeah. kind of like judgmental yeah. and yeah yeah it's a good point i mean i i think that they're 
I think it's inherently tied to anything independent minded because there is this uh, ferociousness around, you know, being untainted and having principles and Mm -hmm. like being different than the mainstream music world. So, of course, its particular scene is going to be more harsh on its own. Um, in order to, you know, whatever, it's it's the same correlation you can make where it's just like, oh, the reason we have a free press that, you know, pays a lot of attention to our government is the fact that if if we don't have a free press that pays attention to the government, we turn into, you know, a completely different set of rules and everything like yeah. that. But I mean, it, to me, the independent music scene should just, you know, like take it easy in regards to that criticism because it's like, yeah, you, you, you're maybe having the wrong target. Yeah. Like, and you, And you know what? Some things I understand. Like, I would never do a, another Youth Today record. Youth of Today was just sort of like a product of crazy youthful energy. Sure. I mean, you can't recreate that. You yeah, know? That's Like true. a bunch of, like, 19-year-old <laughs> kids that are just, you know... Right. You know, just out to, like, you know, bring this thing to the world. And, you know, yeah, it, yeah. it was just kind of like that sort of thing. Sure. I would do another Shelter record, though. I mean, I think, like... And, and you see bands like Into Another, they just did that that new record. I exactly. think like, you know, with bands like that that have a little more space and room and we're a little bit more kind of mature to begin with. Absolutely. You know, I think there's room to sort of grow and, and, and do new stuff. Yeah. Well, you, you had a wider musical palette to, yeah. to paint. I mean, because Shelter, I mean, every, you could argue like every single record sounded different. Yeah. And so, yeah, there's, well, there's plenty of room for you to be like, oh, yeah, like we can take uh, maybe a little bit from each record and come out with a new record. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I, I mean, totally, it'll probably but, never happen anyway. Yeah, but still, right. You, <laughs> yeah, we're all like so busy now. <laughs> yeah. But I would like to at least think that, you know. The opportunity would be there to you know get together with a bunch of old friends and maybe make some new music and yeah, that would be good and release it and you know yeah have fun with it yeah yeah exactly well dude thank you so much for hanging out this has been right, cool. yeah, enjoyable it's fun. for me yeah, it's, fun. <laughs> it's fun it's a beautiful day out we're just hanging out talking yeah, the court if you were recording it would have been great. <laughs> yes, John Porcel, awesome, awesome, awesome guy, and uh, it was funny too because. During, I think at one point in the middle of our conversation, like his uh, his son came into the room and was like, "Oh, sorry, I didn't I didn't see that you was recording a podcast." But uh, anyways, yeah, I really appreciate you hanging out with me, John, for or Porcel. I, I just feel weird calling him Porcel. I mean, I know that's what everyone calls him, but yeah, I'll call him Porcel. Let's, let's call him that, okay? So thank you, Porcel, for letting me hang out at your apartment, and thank you to my good buddy Mike Mowry for hooking this up. And, um, yeah, I just love it when people are like, Hey, you should be on this show. And it's like, yes, you're right. You should. So that is exactly how this happened. And like I said, shelters playing this is hardcore in a couple weeks. So, uh, if you are in that general area or want to make your way out there, please. Yeah. Just Google, this is hardcore and you'll be able to find ticket information, all that other stuff. So that's what we got there. And, uh, next week I will not be taking the week off. Like you might have maybe guessed based on the fact I said I was on vacation, but the show must go on. Next week is Brett Detar from the Juliana Theory. And um, yeah, that was a real fun conversation because within the first like two, three minutes of me laying into my first question, he was like, I can't believe we're starting here. This kind of makes me mad, like in a joking way. But like, I was like, oh, all right, this is where we're going. So <laughs> it, was, it wasn't contentious, uh, but it was definitely a, uh, a fun way to start off the conversation. And it was, uh, it was quite good. So, And mind you, that con- this conversation with Brett was recorded before the band announced that they weren't going to be doing their, uh, the, these dates that they had planned in the summer. So anyways, that being said, you should have a good week and please be safe, everybody. You've been listening to the Jabberjaw Podcast Network, jabberjawmedia.com. When the world gets in the way of your music, try the new Bose Quiet Comfort Earbuds 2. Next gen earbuds uniquely tuned to the shape of your ears. They use exclusive Bose technology that personalizes the audio performance to fit you delivering the world's best noise cancellation and powerfully immersive sound, so you can hear and feel every detail of the music you love. Bose QuietComfort Earbuds 2, sound shape to you. To learn more, visit Bose.com.